First of all, I would like to thank uh, University Lab Partners for uh, making this happen uh, for this sponsorship. So we have uh, Sam from University Lab Partners who will take a couple of minutes to say something about ELP, um, details about ELP. It's a great um, resource, wet lab resource uh, here at UCI, which you, depending on if you're going to be an entrepreneur or your faculties, could make use of. Sam. Hi everyone, uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Samuel, I'm from University Lab Partners, and as you heard from the video, we're a non-profit wet lab incubator. We're going to be located at the UCI Research Park, and what we do is we rent out lab space such as lab benches, private lab suites for startups and entrepreneurs to um, really do their research for their companies. And we're going to be actually co-located with the Beautiful Applied Innovation. Uh, the video is actually a bit old. It said opening fall 2019, but we're opening in uh, December, actually. So it's a bit further back, but um, yeah, I'm just glad that you guys are all here. Uh, we're happy to sponsor the event for all you guys. And if you guys ever decide in the future maybe to do your own startup or become entrepreneurs yourselves, hopefully we can be a resource for you guys and help you out with your company. And uh, just thank you so much. So uh, we can get started. If I can start with Julius first. Julius, can you um, introduce yourself first? Sure. I'll, I think half of us know you very well. I know. If not, places. then this is the time to know Julius. Um, tell me about your career journey. You work at UCI yes. and uh, where you are right now, Julius. Definitely. So hello again. And that comes a lot of GPS STEM. Congrats again. <laughs> Often. Um, my name is Julius. I was a recent graduate from UCI. Not that recent anymore, 2017. I went to fall 2017 uh, in chemical engineering and material science, not just separate departments. Um, my focus was on uh, nanomedicine and engineering in nanomedicine. When I, when I was in grad school, I started a startup company at the same time. And then when I graduated, I worked with my startup company for a bit. I'm still working on the startup company, but I also took on another job with Zamo Research as a um, business development associate. That's why I am right now during the daytime. And at nighttime, I do my startup company. So I kind of just keep busy <laughs> when I can. And that's a little bit of my current journey. And it's still in progress. Okay. Martha? Well, I'd like to think we're also a work in progress. <laughs> <laughs> so um, Martha Davis, I currently work for Danaher Diagnostics. Although if you look at my, uh, that, that's as of October 1st, I moved from one of their subsidiaries, so Beckman Coulter who you're all probably familiar with, and um, I was chief data scientist for the workflow and IT solutions. Um, that was my second job out of college. It will be 30 years in April that I will have been with that company. Second job, a little bit longer than I've been out of college. Um, and I've had probably just about every role in research and development that you can possibly imagine around biological devices. So from um, assay development, to software development, to system development, to system design, um, and now informatics, and now I'm looking cross, cross businesses. So not just at the business that I grew up in, but also the related ones within you know, Danaher Diagnostics. So um, bring on the questions, because um, <laughs> there's, there's a lot going on, and a lot of opportunities for you all coming out of school. Well, you. Hi, uh, Will. Nice to meet you guys. Um, let's see, uh, I graduated from UCLA with my doctorate in 2013. I uh, did a little bit of postdoc, decided I, I, don't know, I didn't want to stay in the academic route, and so I um, started working in biotech uh, at a company called Faith Therapeutics in San Diego, um, and then switched over to a, a different biotech company called uh, Irvine Scientific, uh, I'm local to here. Um, then decided, uh, maybe I don't want to stick with research, maybe I want to try something different. Um, and about a little over two years ago, I switched over to Allergan as a senior medical writer. So, um, any of you interested in writing or even in um, industry uh, uh, research, uh, definitely can point you to a lot of good resources. We'd love to answer any questions you guys have. So, well, maybe I can again, you know, start from that side. So uh, can you describe, you did PhD, postdoc, and then you're a medical writer. That's a totally different world for us out here. You know, for us, it's just like, okay, I want to get there, but I don't know what it involves. Can you describe a little bit about the company you focus, you know, companies related to science? Sure, specifically as a medical writer? Yes. Okay. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something that I had no idea about, um, especially while I was in grad school. Um, I knew there were, like, different, different job opportunities within writing. 
Um, but as I'm even in the field now, I realize how broad it is. Um, so the very small subset of the type of writing within this whole field called medical writing that I'm responsible for. Um, so, and this could be different for whatever, whichever company you're with too, so there's a lot of nuances. Specifically, my role at Allergan, I'm part of the external publications team. And where that fits in is, so Allergan is a pharmaceutical company, also a medical device company. Um, there are various points in the development of a drug or a device to get it into market, all the way from very early preclinical studies to even after it's already been out in market for a while, they have to keep doing studies to look at long-term safety and efficacy and things like that. There's many different departments within Allergan that are responsible for the, those different aspects of that product. And so by FDA regulations, um, most of this, the data that we generate has to be publicly disclosed. And the, the means by which most, including Allergan, will, will go about doing that is by publishing their data at a, at a conference as like a, a podium presentation, poster, and obviously you have to submit an abstract to get accepted and so forth. Um, and then also as manuscripts in peer reviewed journals. So where I come in, um, those different groups are doing all those studies. They generate their study reports. And I sit with uh, someone called the publication manager and the rest of the representatives from each of those teams. And we figure out, okay, so this is an, this is an important project for our group. So uh, who wants this project? So like, we'll go through and decide amongst different writers, hey, this is one I'm really interested in. So I'll take on that project. And then what happens from there is then I look over all the, all the data and then set up calls with um, people that we decide should be authors on that paper. So a lot of the different physicians and key opinion leaders that have played an integral role in running that study. So I'll set up the calls, all the emails back and forth to then compile. Okay, all right, so this is the timeline of like the different milestones of this manuscript development. This is, the, this, this is how I'm planning to structure the, the manuscript. And then you kind of go back and forth, so outline development, and then draft one, draft two, and, and so forth until you finally submit. So where I come in is, is the writing, as well as the project management aspect of getting all the people together. Sometimes it's like herding cats. <laughs> you know, a lot of authors. Um, and so, yeah, that's kind of in a nutshell of, a, of my specific kind of nuanced um, experience in, in medical writing. Martha? Same question. <laughs> yes, same question. I know you sort of like answered it, but is there, is there anything you would like to add, like specific job responsibilities which are coming right out of like STEM, uh, or out of STEM PhD postdocs which you're involved in? So, um, so when we talk STEM, we're talking pretty much any of the aspects I was talking about. So let me talk a little bit about the last role that I had. So this might spark a little bit of interest. Um, so as um, chief data scientist, one of the things I was responsible for was understanding the information that was generated by our instrumentation. Of course, because they're diagnostics instruments, um, there's a lot of um, correlations between the information that comes off of the instrumentation and the actual way assays would operate. So one of my roles was to actually work with each of the different groups that generated data. So that could be the chemists that needed data to understand how their assays were working, or the hardware engineers to understand how the system, what the timing was, or the software engineers to understand what types of um, monitoring they needed to do. Same thing with the hardware engineers. And the interrelationship of all that information, how to get it from point A to point X lots of steps in between, how to organize that information, and how to deliver it to the appropriate people or make it available to the appropriate people to use it for whatever it was that they were going to use it for. So that required a lot of coordination with teams, required coordination of my own team, and um, we did a lot of work overseas, or do a lot of work overseas. So um, lots of late night phone calls and early morning phone calls, and uh, pretty fun stuff. Thank you, Martha. Mm -hmm. so I'm sorry that you had to struggle with finding I'm the parking. I'm so sorry. I'm right. so glad that you're here. Just so fun I'll have then two questions for you. First, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself briefly, your career journey, and your current company and role. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, uh, so my name is Christian. Uh, I'm originally from China. I came to the U.S. about 11 years ago to pursue my PhD in neuroscience in North Carolina State University. Uh, and after that, I went to UCLA as the postdoc, uh, also in neuroscience. Uh, and then kind of like starting from second year of my postdoc, I realized that career, like academia is not really my career. And then I started to look for all the career opportunity outside of academia. So about two years ago, I had my first industry job in Medtronic uh, as a medical writer. Ever since I stayed there, and it's been a pretty rewarding journey for me. Great. Is that the first question or just the intro? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think you touched upon the second part also. Um, like any, sp uh, what I just, uh, although Will mentioned uh, the medical writing responsibility, are they uh, maybe there are like different in different companies uh, medical writing jobs? So, what are your specific responsibilities at Medtronic mm -hmm. as a medical writer? Okay. Uh, so for me, uh, I'm very like a, my role is very specialized in regulatory writing. So my role is to generate scientific contents and clinical study report, evaluation report to support any regulatory submission. So uh, I know that like medical writer, the, the title can be the same from job uh, description to job description, but like depending on whether you're working in a com uh, scientific communication or medical communication agent versus you work at like a startup versus if you work at like a uh, big company like big pharma or big like medical device company, they might mean slightly different thing. Uh, like if you're working in like a smaller like a startup, you probably wear multiple hats. Like sometimes you touch a little bit about publication, like education, like a you know, patient education. Uh, but for my role specifically, is highly specialized in regulatory documents. So, yeah. Uh, so in the business development role, it's uh, a little bit of uh, it's less on the I don't know. It's a little bit still maintain the stamp side because my role on a day to day is to kind of initiate partnerships of, amongst academia, industry, um, what is business to business or. Uh, individual labs, it's kind of weird. So, <laughs> when most people ask what business development does, the main goal is pretty much to take everything that a company creates or create or has interest in and match it some way out in the world and try to see what else is out in the world and bring it back to the company, kind of set those partnerships, whether it's research collaborations or um, in, in licensing or out licensing technology. So that's kind of what I do now. So on the technical side of it, I get to at least see what people, new, tech, um, new science people are doing. If I don't get to do it anymore myself, and I kind of miss that. But luckily, because I have a night shift, I still get to work in a lab, work on my own stuff. So yeah, you sleep. <laughs> I sleep. <laughs> actually, I found recently that I should do better on less sleep, but sleep past seven hours, I get really sluggish. But five to six is the best time. I woke up at 3 a.m. this morning, so <laughs> But it's a, it's a nice kind of interest and balance in, in the business development side of it. Getting to see technical, but not to do technical. And if that's something that you're interested in, I always talk to them about that. Well, thank you. I think so. This was the starting of our, like, you know, we are just like warming up, and now we're getting to the main focus of the event, which is how to get hired. Like, what are the different steps in the hiring process? So, Julius, maybe if I can start with you. Um, sure. You said you have some experience, like, um, in the hiring process. You've screened, yes. uh, selected some candidates. Yes. So maybe we can start from um, the question, like, because not all of us know that how many different steps are there in the hiring, hiring process. One which we hear recruiter, then there's an HR person, then hiring manager, and then we finally get selected. Yeah. Then all of you could actually, you know, feel free to jump in whenever you don't have to go in sequence. Uh, all right, so describe the process steps. I guess Zymo is smaller than some of the other companies here. So <laughs> um, the, uh, in Zymo's case, the job is usually, if the job is posted online or wherever, I always tell people the best way is to find someone within the company and let them know because then they just give directly to the hiring manager or HR. Because typically, if the job is posted and then it's posted on multiple sites, so it's posted on LinkedIn, Indeed, um, Zip Recruiter, and all those other sites, and then they get aggregated and get collected together. And for the positions I was looking at, interested in for my team, um, I get a folder every day of just all the resumes that come in, and I just click through like, and I look for a key that I'm interested in. 
So for the BD role, I was looking for someone that was good at communication, had some quick, uh, capable science background, and had some interactions dealing with customers or dealing with people outside of a lab setting. So then I just looked for that quickly, like I haven't done anything in these roles, and then, okay, move into a pile, reach out, and then I, I send that pile to the hiring manager. That, that's what I'm interested in. And then from there, she does an initial phone call and then does her own screening. And then the one, then it's multiple rounds of interviews. So it's typically two rounds of interviews, and I'm in one of those rounds of interviews, and somebody else in the company else is it. Whether it's my director of marketing or the VP of business development, somebody else jumps in and then We'll go from there and we'll discuss afterwards. So, I don't know. <laughs> so, how, yeah. how we did it. Feel free to whenever we wants to take it. Sure. Uh, so, for my experience, so ever since I joined the group, and I joined this like a small group with only two medical writers, but ever since that our group expanded quite a lot, so I, I managed to kind of like be involved in the hiring process from when we first identified the candidate and my manager will talk to them for the first round of screening and then I'm like completely involved in the interviewing process and the decision making process. So if you guys have any interview related questions, feel free to ask. Uh, one thing I do want to add on that is that like the typical route you think about job application is that you spend a lot of time through the job posting, you find the one that you're interested in, you go for online application and hopefully someone will read your resume. That's kind of like a, for my opinion, that's probably kind of like an outdated, like not like a best way to go because not sure if you guys know that like right now a lot of companies they use the applicant checking system. Uh, in the first step to kind of uh, actually no one read your resume first because it's going to be read by some kind of algorithm and they use some kind of like really not very smart like matching keyword system to see they look at your uh, they compare your uh, the job posting versus your resume and then if your uh, score is lower than let's say 30% match then actually your resume would not actually get to your HR or the hiring manager to look at them. So I just personally suggest that if you actually already know someone, if you see a job description that you feel like hey I'm qualified, I'm really interesting, try to network into someone inside the company so that you have a much higher chance that uh, a human being is actually reading your resume, not the uh, computer. Yeah. Actually, I'm going to um, kind of key off of that. So um, one of the things that I've actually found frustrating with that actual process is depending on what company you work with that does the pre-screening, a lot of times that they actually don't even find the right candidates. There's a disconnect between what you're actually looking for and the resumes that are coming in. And I've actually found that the resumes sometimes that I wanted to, to read were the ones that had been rejected versus the ones that were actually passed on to me. And so as a, as a, not a, so it's funny, you guys are talking about hiring manager as somebody that's managing the hiring. I was the hiring manager as the person that was actually doing the hiring. So um, as the hiring manager in that context, I have actually shut off that functionality where I've worked with HR and said, please stop screening my resumes. You're screening everybody out. I, 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 I can't even get to to see the people that I want to, so that the candidates were coming in were not necessarily the ones I was looking for. Mm -hmm. um, otherwise, the process is pretty much the same. Um, with the exception, one of the things that I did, because um, um, when I would be looking for somebody, I would be looking for somebody that would be part of a team. So depending on what that team is, sometimes it wouldn't just be me interviewing and then somebody else, one of my peers, sometimes I would actually have an interview by other people on the team to make sure that they, there was compatibility depending on what the job was because it's really important that people can actually work together. And a lot of times it's not necessarily who you're working for, it's who you're working with. Yeah, no, I mean, it's a great wealth of information. Um, I mean, you guys covered already so much basic with it. Um, definitely, uh, it's different from company to company. That's just one rule of thumb that I think always should be remembered. Um, I remember when I was looking into it, it's like, you kind of think like, oh yeah, every company has the same setup and system, but obviously you can, you can appreciate that that's not the case. Um, depending on if it's a larger company or a smaller company, it's gonna make a huge difference. Like, for example, the right before my current job, uh, we were, I mean, we're a pretty small company, we're, we're my scientific, it's not that big, um, and our R&D department was like, what, like 20 people, um, and HR didn't really, I think HR was like two people, so we had to handle most of the of the whole hiring process. There wasn't like a formalized um, like algorithm or anything, 
there wasn't this like super long, like whereas at Allergan, for example, I, I think it took me like an hour to fill out all the different like components like the, of the information they want. Whereas at, at Irvine Scientific, it was just, hey, here's this email, submit your resume and your cover letter. <laughs> so it's, it's very different. Every company is very different. Um, and yeah, so whereas for example, like uh, as they were mentioning, um, and I think it's really important, that, that whole algorithm aspect, and even if it's a smaller company, and we, we'll probably get into this more in detail, but how critical it is to tailor your resume and your cover letter to the job description. I, I can't stress that enough. Because, right, like, as, as Julius was saying, like, he's getting folders of resumes coming to him. What's going to be the quickest way to, to sort through that? One even other tip is, like, on your resume, having a little brief summary of what, what you're about, of why you're applying, or just, like, a summary of your skills or important attributes about you that that line up with the, the, um, the job description. So, little, little things like that. So, wait, Will, you kind of like stole my question. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Job. I think there's a question for Mark. Please. Yeah, uh, speaking of this, uh, you know, the topic about resumes, um, let's, let's say, of course you want to match your, your resume to the, doc, to the job description, but let's say you have like additional um, things about you. If it, would it be better to include those even if it doesn't match? Or not included, so it like, yeah, so. Yes. So include? Yes. Okay. Maybe have it at the bottom, or probably. Or, or, like I'm saying, like, if I wanted to match a specific job, would I want to put all, like, the more relevant stuff at, at the top? Yes. Or yes. 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 Depending on how long, you want to keep your resume as short and succinct as possible. When you're going through a lot of them, you want to make sure that somebody can look at it and, and get who you are, right? Because <laughs> if you're looking at three pages of stuff, I'm promising you, I might look at three pages of stuff because that's what I do, but the people that are screening are not looking at three pages of stuff. So what length would you recommend, like at a maximum? Two page. Two, Two page max. max. And if you can put your relevant stuff up first and then have the rest of your history behind, that's probably even better. So. Was this your question? No. I no. Okay, somebody <laughs> had like similar, exact similar question. So it was how much would you need to match a job posting to actually have a chance to be considered? If you're missing some essentials, uh, would you, uh, could it still be a good idea? To play? So can, can I answer that one? Um, so one of the things about adding those extra things that don't seem to be relevant, depending on what the position is that you've applied for, what it tells the person that's looking at your resume is that you have a very broad interest base and that you're capable of learning more things. So if you are matching exactly what the position is and that happens to be the only thing you've ever done, or at least it's the only thing I can tell you've ever done, then I might be concerned as an R&D manager that maybe you haven't done very much or you're not interested in doing very many other things. So making sure that even if you've dabbled in things, you, you list it there, and then to follow up with that when you're on the interview, you can say, yes, I listed it, but I dabbled in it, but I have more interest in looking at this or doing this. I personally, as an R&D manager, I'm looking for breadth of knowledge and ability to learn. That's what I'm looking for. I don't know about some of the other ones, but for me, that's really high on my list. Ability to learn is actually one of the key pins in any job. So even my position, I never did business development before. Um, I went in, I met with the CEO, and we're just talking for an hour or so at my interview. And it's kind of like, what do you want to do? I'm like, actually, I don't know per se, but I'm open to learning. That's my key thing for wanting to apply for this job is that I want to learn how to do this job better, not just for your company, but for my own company also. And it's like, oh, that's interesting. Like, tell me more about yourself. And we went into a conversation. So even when I was interviewing for other people and helping interview for my team is that the one guy that ended up joining my team, he never did the position either, but he was like, I don't know much about this, but I'm willing to learn and I want to learn and I'm curious. And that's actually kind of what I found. That's one of the key things I like about people is just the ability to learn or the willingness to learn. So 
So this actually kind of like answers one question, I think. Yeah. Um, so do you know the majority of the knowledge needed for your job prior to getting the job? So I'm, I guess I'm getting the answer that no, it doesn't. You don't necessarily need to have that information beforehand. You can actually get in and learn and show that you are open to learning. Right. Yes, please. Um, my research is basically theory, and I'm a little bit um, concerned if I can persuade someone to hire me, because industry is different from like what I'm doing right now. So I have some sort of difficulty finding positions, and I'm not sure if I can persuade that these theories fit like positions. So is there any way to persuade people to hire me somehow? <laughs> so, so maybe that's a million dollar question. Like, what do you guys really look for in a candidate? I, I think I can speak to that. If I can. So in terms of like how specific you should stick with your own like therapeutic like uh, expertise from the PhD training. Um, like for my, uh, just take my group as example. Like we have seven medical writer. And then, like our business unit is neuroscience. But then, like when we were interviewing candidates, we are very open to like people coming from completely different uh, expertise. Like we have some from immunology, we have some from completely different field. So when we look for um, when we interview the candidate, we kind of more like want to see how, just like you mentioned, if they are willing to learn. Like first of all, if they are truly interested in the precision. And then, uh, are they willing to learn? Do they already like kind of spend a little bit of extra time to learn about what we do here? And then, how fast can they learn? Like per perhaps like bringing some example. Like I take some courses here. Like I, I used to learn this one. Like I'm a fast learner. That kind of thing. So to answer your question, I don't think so. So do not be afraid or scared if that particular job you're interested in doesn't have like a perfect match to your own expertise. Yeah. Kind of hop on that quickly, and also I don't know if you guys still do this the side to PhD, yeah, the PhD, side PhD course. Yeah, this is a super expensive one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, looking, like yeah, yeah, no, we're looking for like smaller versions of that. We used to do side PhD business of science for scientists uh, boot camp, which I think yeah. part is better than that time. Yes, so it was a super expensive, but it was a three day boot camp, which I think some of you people took it, right? So everyone told me it was like amazing course, but we are looking for more compressed version of that, maybe a day workshop or maybe a couple of hours, depending on like, you know when they are around. But yeah, please. well, no, pretty much the key part of that is that even if you are in theory or in some interesting part of field, you still get your PhD at the end of the day, and you learn all the skill sets, all the tools that you can apply to a breadth a broad area of. Um, professions. Just gotta find first what you're interested in, and then how can you take what you already know, learned during your PhD training, because there's a training um, apprenticeship in a sense, and then apply that to that role, and just find what where it fits. Okay. Bill, you can. Yeah. Um. I I think um. Because like we when you look at different job postings, you're probably trying to. I mean, at least what I was trying to do was like, okay. Based on the sometimes not so good description, <laughs> I don't think they don't always do a good job in, in those job postings. Um, they don't. They're they're pretty sparse on the actual details. Um, so I'm trying to assess like, okay, based on what I've done and trying to match it up as best as possible with this. Can I see myself doing the job? I think we can get caught up in the weeds doing that. If it somewhat looks interesting, and it's for example, especially like, say as a grad student. You're about to finish your defense and, and graduate, right? And you want you you're looking for that that first job outside of you know in in, um, in industry. Um, yeah, just I would say just apply no matter what. And and it's even during the interview process you can find out more. Um, also, you don't even know like it, it's a position where like you initially didn't even think you're interested, but as you're doing the job, you're learning. You're 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 developing yourself even as a future applicant for other positions, so even as a stepping stone. So don't think like, like yeah, this this is going to be the career for the next uh, like forty years of my life. Al although it can be, it, it, like it thirty years of your life, that it, it could really work out in that amazing way. But a lot of times it's just that that first job. Like for my example, like the, the first company I was with for about a year, that was just a stepping stone to the next one that then led me in a completely different direction, outside of research and into medical writing. And even from here, I have no idea where it's gonna lead me, but I'm approaching it as, yeah, it's like, these are all stepping stones and learning experiences. School never ends, in a sense, right? It's just 
the classroom setting changes, right? But it like having that same mentality of yeah, like with each job, with each with each challenge, I'm I'm adding new skill sets and right growing my career in that way. So to I don't know your name um, to your um, to your question or what would you um, pose? I, I I would encourage you just keep looking at like different like outside of uh, what you would normally look for and let that kind of but uh, then I, I will have the problem that they don't look at my resume it's like the networking should be a little bit difficult so I should find people and contact them directly so that I don't go through that resume checking things yes. I also think it depends on what kind of job you're looking for, right? Are you looking for a job specifically in your field based off of your research? That's going to be a little more complicated than just looking for something that asks for a master's or a PhD in chemistry or biochemistry or, or, or science just in general. And a lot of times what they're looking for there is they don't even necessarily care what your research was in. They care that you received the degree. And by receiving the degree, you've done research, you've done report writing and your dissertation, you've done public speaking, you've done, so you've actually simply by the nature of receiving your degree, you have some pretty heavy duty qualifications right there without even being specifically in your particular field. So something to consider there. And actually as we were talking, I was thinking intellectual property and um, certainly um, you might even look at stuff outside of still related to STEM, but there's some things you can do legally and around property and around just knowledge checking that um, PhD candidates are really good at. Yeah, I was a stem cell biologist, now I write for facial aesthetics. So <laughs> <laughs> it's like, I would have never imagined in a million years that I'd be writing about Botox and fillers and cool stuff. <laughs> yeah, <so. laughs> you go ahead. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, I am about graduation next June, and currently I'm trying to apply for different jobs. But what I'm assuming is that it's too early because most of the job postings are for now. For example, they are in need of someone. But uh, for some reasons, for example, if I don't get a job, I can extend my PhD. Or for example, I, sh I need to know if I have to relocate. And so uh, how it can work, for example, for me to know my um, after graduation path? Actually, I have a really great example. Um, so recently our company hired new writers, and there was a graduate student from UCI. I don't know if you know Sarah Cross. She does the Bruce Yeah, she was part of the Bruce and Yeah, Yeah, yeah. Oh, Bruce and Bruce, yeah. yeah. Um, she <laughs> Bruce for Rain, sorry. <laughs> That's funny. Bruce, Bruce and Rain. Yeah, I had to mix up. Um, <laughs> she, she actually got hired before she defended I think she was about a month out. And so she was able to actually work it out with her PI to be wrapping things up with her dissertation defense and then also starting at the company. So I mean, it's, it's possible and that I think it, it, it varies for each person and what their relationship is like with their PI. I would think that's a little bit more on the rare side, probably, um, but it's still possible. Uh -huh. So um, it's also possible, so um, I've hired master's students where they've actually worked as interns or part-time, and then when they've graduated, pull them on. Yeah. So um, don't, don't let applying for it hold you up, but you also might want to look at something that's part-time, simply to get your foot in the door. Um, so maybe that's not the exact position that you want, but certainly once you're in the door, people know you, people know what kind of work you do, and it makes it a little bit easier to actually move to that other position. Look for internship programs, look for early graduate, like right after you graduate programs, that they exist. Um, if you're just looking just to get a job, this is probably a little bit early if you're graduating in June. Yeah. The positions are most likely going to be gone. So, for example, for those part-time jobs, or for example, internships, for example, like spring, for example, winter, what should I put as my graduation date in my resume? Your because real graduation date. Oh, okay. So You're they should graduate. decide about that. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, a lot of times they're looking for specifically for when people will be available. So if you put a date out different and then you go in, you're wasting everybody's time. Your time and that time. Yeah. It makes it a little bit harder to rebound from that. Okay. Yeah. But what, one thing I would like to add to that though, I, getting started early, there, there's still a, a benefit in it. Definitely like, I, 
I don't know, like some people probably argue maybe you shouldn't apply because yeah, it, like it's a whole process that, that even that company has to go through. But it, if anything, reaching out like using LinkedIn or any sort of networking opportunity to start connecting with people like early, I think that's that would be, that's fantastic. And also, one other thing is like and going back to like the job description. I don't know how to put it. There's like company speak. Yep. It's it's, it's weird. Like yeah, it's, it's like a language stuff. that you kind of yeah. have to to learn. And when you start figuring out that company speak, then you can it, it helps you in tailoring your resume and cover letter. So what I found super helpful was, I you know you kind of like LinkedIn stock people, <laughs> like so like I was interested in medical writing, so I would type in medical writing in, in LinkedIn, a bunch of people's profiles come up. I'm gonna start just clicking on them and just reading like how did they describe their job, what they do, and then I start figuring out, oh, okay so that's how they worded it and. I mean, it started making sense, and then that's when, and then like as I'm like looking at, oh, this job looks interesting. I'm reading that job description. I don't know. It, it just then started coming together. I'm like, okay, like that's how they word it, and so that helped me later when, like, I, I had I had to sit down and actually write my own stuff. So getting started on things like that early would be definitely to your advantage. So one quick question, there was a situation actually, one of the students reached out to me because they were doing an internship in a company and the company was so impressed with the person, they said, okay, we are ready to hire you. They actually offered the person a job, but the student had like three months left and they thought they will graduate in three months. However, when they talked to PI, PI was like, I think company can wait. They really like you, they're impressed with you. So is that true or she should actually hurry up and get, get out? It's true. <laughs> Okay. It's true. It happens. Mm -hmm. It happens. They want you bad enough, it happens. Okay. But um, isn't it like there are a lot of people applying and then, you know, if you are the final candidate, there are probably like four or five other people who are really close to um, being final, but then if the company is in a hurry, they would like to move over to the next candidate. I honestly, it. it's position by position and it's hiring manager against hiring manager. Yeah. So I mean, sometimes you just find the perfect person that's going to fit in your team and you're excited about them. He's sitting here smiling. <laughs> and and it, it really does have to do with how well you fit into the position and how urgent it is. So okay. although what I've discovered with um, that level of urgency, two things can drive the level of urgency. One could be the resource. Are you going to have the position? Do I have to? Positions go away. They don't just go away for you, they go away for us, right? Sometimes it's like, you know, there's going to be a budget crunch, and if I don't fill this position right now, I'm not going to have it. If that's the case, you're not going to be able to hurry up fast enough to be done anyways. So I have to fill it or lose it. But then the other thing is, it may not be something that it matters, and that sounds really awful, but it's good for all of you, right? It may not be somebody that, that or a position that matters so much that it's just you. It could just be a person or a body that has similar skills because we know we're going to train them, those kinds of things. So it really depends on the person, what the specific position is, and, and the speed. I just want to jump in quickly on that. I would say definitely apply now. It depends also on your field. Some fields that there's a huge need for certain types of, I don't know, one example is bioinformaticians, for example. There's such a need within the biotech field for bioinformaticians, that if people find good bioinformaticians, they will wait and keep a contact and just kind of like, okay, you know what, finish up, we're still gonna, it's probably gonna be open for you and what's come to us, we'll hire another person on, including you, because we really like you, we have some, we had a good feeling about you. And just a quick quip on that is that one typical way hiring is I'm one thing we typically look for the most out of any, there, I keep saying this for each one, but one of the entire company as a whole, because we're talking about company culture, is Zymo typically tries to look for just generally good people. Not like good and some good workers, just, it's like the Google model, that's not really true, but just be good, don't be evil, but just be a generally good person, and that's usually kind of like, if you can find a person that you meet in an interview, and they are generally just a good person, and they meet all the other, 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 other criteria. Like, you know what? Yeah, we could wait. No problem. We'll figure it out. So it depends. Yeah. I just wanted to add to that. So actually, my apartment mate, she interviewed during the summer for a position that was coming in April or May. So it's not, it really depends on the company. It really depends on what position you're looking for. I'm not very sure about the details about her position. I just know it's very scientific. 
Um, and so like even like I think to William's point is starting now is never a bad time. Um, I did an internship during my first year summer as a PhD student and applying to that um, the description of what they were looking for was a person who was going to graduate and was going to be an undergrad. I'm a PhD student <laughs> coming in with not a person who was going to graduate, but I was the only person they hired out of the 20 that they interviewed. And so it goes to show like, it doesn't necessarily, like the companies don't know what they're asking for sometimes. <laughs> 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 and so as a result of that, don't be shy to apply regardless, even if you're not sure if your graduation date make, makes sense or not. Question from the audience. So, what are some red flags that you find upon your first interaction with the interviewee, whether it be through the phone or in person? So many. <laughs> <laughs> One, I mean, genuineness. Like, you can you can really tell when someone is like, making it up. Yeah. If you don't know something, you don't know it. Like, just and don't no need to over exaggerate your your application. Like, just be sincere and genuine, I think it is. And that kind of gets to, because we're, we're as, like, one of the big assessments are, can I trust this person? Can I work with this person? Not just, do they, you know, can they have all these skills that we're looking for, but are they someone that I will genuinely like working with five days a week, five, six days a week, maybe even, so. Yeah, um, so as you Building off of this, one thing I've learned from interviewing a lot of professionals was that company culture is really the thing that determines whether or not you're going to stay somewhere, if all that training is really worth it, if you're really worth the company's investment. But what I have trouble trying to figure out is how do you gauge what a company's culture really is as an interviewee without like asking too many questions and seeing kind of suspicious, like you might not be around for too long, or like how do you really project that you're a good fit for the company in the small amount of time you have in the interview? So you know, teach me. <laughs> so, so actually, I do appreciate it when a candidate asks questions. So, so be prepared to ask questions. And actually, you were asking about red flags. Um, people that only answer the question that I asked and not the question that I was trying to ask. I mean, we're people too, right? So, it's. You're not asking people yes or no questions. You're asking people, hopefully, opening questions so that you can talk about your experiences. And if it comes back, yes, I did that, like, <laughs> you're probably not going to be real successful with me. So um, you're looking for people that actually are able to talk about what they've done and, and, um, and then reflect back, right? And sometimes even say, this is what you asked me. Um, so I'm going to talk about this. Is that what you're asking about? Do you know what I mean? So that there's actually a dialogue. And that's, that's really important. And that might irritate some people, but I really appreciate it. Because again, I'm, I'm looking for somebody to have an interaction with. So I have a question about the whole hiring process. Is the interview more like uh, sort of like you interview and then uh, the decision making is more intuitive or it's based on scoring of that interviewing. So it's like if I do great at an interview, uh, I'm a guarantee to get the job. I think I can, we, we have something very specific to the team that, so basically our interview, like all the team member will interview the uh, candidate and after that we do have a, I actually really love that. It's the discussion meeting. Everyone talk about what is the pros and cons, like what you like about this candidate, what you don't like. So it's literally like a board just right. This is what I like. This is what I don't like. So like, and then the team will come up with a um, kind of like a conclusion whether we all like this person or whether we have a little bit of concern or whether this person just have red flags that we're just going to not consider this person at all. So, but I think this is probably like from company to company. Um, yeah. we, we have a similar process, but you have to get through a screening interview first. Mm -hmm. So in other words, there, usually there's a couple of different people that will go through, and we split the resumes up, and we'll go through a lot of a phone conversation before we ever decide whether to bring them in or not. Mm -hmm. So again, one of the things, if somebody can't 
doesn't seem engaged on the phone. I've had people where it's like obvious that they were not prepared to, to be on the phone. If you're not prepared for a screening interview, I'm not going to bother to bring you in to talk to my team. I just, I'm not going to. Um, you know, it speaks to commitment even to yourself if you're not in your own commitment to getting a job, let alone working for somebody. So, um, um, but yes, we do the same thing. And it's sometimes it's scored, just depends on the position. Sometimes it's not. Sometimes you talk to three people, sometimes you talk to six. It just depends. Yeah, it depends on company to company. So, in our case, it's, we're relatively small, so. After the multiple rounds of interviews, everyone just sits in a room and then we just discuss the, what are the positives, negatives, good, yes. And most of the time, for most hires, we try to make it unanimous. Everyone has to say either yes or no. And then if it's kind of in between, we kind of leave it to the, place, the key team that they're going to work with. And then they decide if they want them on the team or not. So, so I actually have a funny anecdote. Um, we had somebody come in and we all voted no. We all voted no, and three months later he was hired. Oh, no. like, How does that even happen? And you know what? It was all no. So, I mean, it works the other way too. We, we didn't think he was a good fit, and then he didn't end up being a good fit. And so, you really want your team that's hiring you to want you. It's not just them wanting you, but there's probably a reason why they saw something that didn't fit. You don't want to work with those people. You don't want to. If you get turned down for a job, say thank you very much because you probably weren't a good fit. So it's just as important to walk away from that than being stuck someplace for a while. So I have one quick question with the interview process. You know, uh, these days companies, in order to save time save before bringing you on site, they do phone interviews, they do Zoom online interviews, teleconference, and they also these days make you record some answers to the questions. Yeah, I did that for two companies, and then they, there were five questions, they said record your answers in this, you know, and you upload these, yeah, small clips. So my biggest concern with that, that and makes me really uncomfortable. <laughs> that, was my, that was my question. So I'm, I'm really good at talking to people one-on-one -on -one and everything, but, you know, phone is a very awkward thing for me because mm -hmm. I cannot see the person online, like I'm like really, I don't know how the person is, you know, uh, emotions are like, you know, sometimes they're saying yes, or you know, suddenly they, they say yes to somebody else because there's someone behind, and I'm like, oh, maybe they are interested. How do you differentiate between a candidate, like, well, this person could have been great on site, we brought this person, maybe they just missed out because they didn't answer things well on telephone, because we all have very different communications kind of styles. Yeah. That's weird. <laughs> so, I mean, is there anything which the company like really gives you benefit of doubt for certain things that okay, maybe the person was not great in answering these questions online or on phone, but still the person is great. So what are those qualities which a company would look for? So, yeah, I can give you another time when this happened. So um, I was actually, and actually interviewing students for an internship from a master's program. And I was a year-long internship as part of the master's program. and. Um, um, hopefully what they're doing is when they actually ask questions, they're asking questions in such a way that you can actually showcase who you are as a person, but also showcase your technical skills. So one of the things that I was looking for was um, ability to communicate. You can communicate adequately well without having a lot of personality, you know, you can get your point across. But what I was looking for was how would you methodically, in this particular interview, methodically go through and solve a problem. So even though this um, individual wasn't necessarily somebody that would more likely sit in the back of a room and not sparkle someplace else, her answer to how she would answer a problem was, wow, that's exactly how I would go about doing it and that's exactly what I'm looking for. So what I'm hoping for is that the people that you interview with are looking for more than just how you are on the phone. There's enough in their questions. <laughs> and again, if you get off from an interview, a phone interview, and you go, I would never want to work with that person, or what a jerk, you really don't want to work with them, right? Because it works both ways. It's not just your interview with them. It's also their interview with you. So. On that note also is that it depends on the job. So we have 
one of the jobs I helped hire for was for our internal sales team, where internal sales has to be on the phone all the time. So, and it needs to be able to call customers and have a conversation with them and discuss and sell. So, if they, during the interview, they lack some ability to communicate or finesse or even just sell, then that's a, a negative towards that because that's what we need for that position. Even if they qualify in all different ways, there's, it's much more difficult to teach somebody how to show charisma in that setting mm -hmm. than to just look for somebody like that. So that's one of the few um, positions that were kind of like, yeah, this is unfortunately not going to work. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so I think a couple of things like really kept coming up, you know, your resume and then you have to, well, you mentioned about like your summary of skills on top and then saying that if you're a right candidate, even if you don't have that technical knowledge, but then maybe you're looking for something overall. So if I were to ask all of you, like, you know, some of the bullet points, like, you know, points, uh, the skills which companies look for. People say project management, organization skills, leadership skills. Uh, could you list some of those? And the most important part, and we all struggle with that part, is I've been doing research in my lab for five years, PhD. I'm a postdoc, and they ask me for leadership skills. I don't know if I have those. They're looking for someone in a supervisory role. I don't know if I can be a supervisor. So what's your take on that? I'll look at one jump in. One thing I want to mention previously also is one good way to practice or even to get the experience of either being an interviewee or being in a supervisory role is with undergrads. So you're graduate students and you have experience with undergrads. So even so, typically when I take on an undergrad, I still actually have undergrads that work for me now, and I just interviewed one last Tuesday. I always interview them, not just not to say whether or not they'll get the position or anything, because I know it's a mentorship position and it's a training position, but it's mostly just to get that vibe that I'll be actually going to get along because I'm going to have to spend a lot of time with you, and I want to make sure that we actually have a personality match. But the cool thing about that is you actually kind of see, you get to be in the opposite side of the hiring position because typically when I'm hiring also is to look for a personality match. That can we actually get along? Can, can we actually be part of a team and see each other day to day and not want to kill each other? So <laughs> that's one of the important part of it. So it's a good practice to see that it's like when you take on new undergrads or if you PI was bringing on a new undergrad, volunteer, like can I just interview them first? You grab the final say, I just want to see that, because I'm going to have to keep an eye on this kid for a while. Can I just interview them to make sure that I know what I'm going to be getting soon? So just volunteer for that. And the benefit of that also is that you could say that once you go to that um, job interview that you have experience in a supervisory role, you have experience um, in a leadership role because you're doing that already in your lab setting. So, and then uh, Serena's questions, we want to keep this is, um, definitely communication because everything outside, even in academia, it deals with working with each other, working with your lab mates, working in a team setting. So being able to translate that into an industry setting because, for example, yesterday I had to go to the hospital quickly with my wife and a customer was calling me like, oh, um, hey Julius, what happens to my account? I can't access my account anymore. I'm trying to do all this on purchases. So I had to end up calling one of my team members back on site like, oh, Christina, um, can you handle this for me? Or this is the situation, can you take care of it? So being able to just know how to reach out to team members when you're not on site or when you need something or who to reach out to is very valuable in an industry setting. So communication is probably the most important one for that I think of. So I think something I can add on to that is like, um, I think a lot of like a PhD or postdoc kind of struggle about is when they're looking for their like a first job into industry, they're like, they kind of don't really fully understand their soft skill. Like for me, like, like everyone's kind of shine, like they're like, no, I don't have leadership skill. I don't have like a, a project management skill, like because I only did my bench work, I only pipe that stuff. <laughs> but so I kind of like strongly recommend you, like if you have not thought about it, just put a piece of paper, put down leadership skill, and then just put three bullet points to highlight some of the things. Try to think from all your pre-existing experience to see in the past, do I have anything that can, that's kind of like related to leadership skill, right? So I actually forced myself to run through that exercise because I got that question a lot during interview. Like, tell me a time 
when you, when you manage a team. Tell me a time when you deal with conflicts. Tell me a time when you successfully lead a project. You need to be prepared for that because we don't normally think about it. We are like so prepared to talk about, oh, what is my research project? Like, what is my paper published about? But we never think about, do I have the management skill? Do I have the communication skill? So I really strongly recommend you to start to think about it, write it down, and be prepared to answer that. Like, even better to provide like an example. Like, tell me a time, you ask yourself, tell me, tell me, tell yourself a time, like, or trying to remember a time that when you successfully manage a project, let's say from a cross-functional team, you collaborate with some other PI, just start to think about it. I really strongly recommend. You don't want to get surprised when someone asks you in the interview and you never thought about it, and you're like, oh no, I don't have leadership skills. So that's probably the worst answer you can provide. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So please like, start to maybe go through the exercise. <laughs>